Hello, and welcome to part two of our reading of Albert Einstein's article, Why Socialism? <clears throat> Let's get started. If we ask ourselves how the structure of society and the cultural attitude of man should be changed in order to make human life as satisfying as possible, we should constantly be conscious of the fact that there are certain conditions which we are unable to modify. As mentioned before, the biological nature of man is, for all practical purposes, not subject to change. Furthermore, technological and demographic developments of the last few centuries have created conditions which are here to stay. The relatively densely packed settled population with the goods which are indispensable to their continued existence, an extreme division of labor and a highly centralized productive apparatus are absolutely necessary. The time which, looking back, looks so idyllic uh, is gone forever, when individuals or relatively small groups could be completely self-sufficient. It's only a slight exaggeration to say that mankind constitutes even now a planetary community of production and consumptions. I've now reached a point where I may uh, indicate briefly what to me constitutes the essence of the crisis in our time. It concerns the relationship of the individual to society. The individual has become more conscious than ever of his dependence upon society, but he does not experience this dependence as a positive asset, as an organic tie, as a productive force, but rather as a threat of his natural rights or even to his economic existence. Furthermore, his position in society is such that the egotistical drives of his makeup are constantly being uh, extenuated, while his social drives, which are by nature weaker, progressively deteriorate. All human beings, whatever their position in society, are suffering from this process of deterioration. Unknowingly prisoners to their own egotism, they feel insecure, lonely, and deprived of the naive, simple, and unsophisticated enjoyment of life. Man can find meaning in life, short and perilous as it is, only through devoting himself to society. The economic anarchy of capitalist society as it exists today is, in my opinion, the real source of the evil. We see before us a huge community of producers, the members of which are unceasingly striving to deprive each other of the fruits of their collective labor, not by force, but on the whole in faithful compliance with legally established rules. In this respect, it's more important to realize that the means of production, that is to say the entire productive capacity that is needed for producing consumer goods as well as additional capital goods, which may be, and for the most part, are private property of individuals. For the sake of uh, simplicity, in this discussion that follows, I shall call workers all of those who do not share the ownership of the means of production, although this does not quite correspond to the cus customary use of the term. The owner of the means of production is in a position to purchase the labor power of the worker. By using the means of production, the worker produces new goods, which become the property of the capitalist. The essential point about this process is the relation between what the worker produces and what he is paid, both measured in terms of real value and so far as the labor, labor contract is free. Uh, what the worker receives is determined not by the real value of the goods he produces, but by his minimum needs and by the capitalist requirements for labor power in relation uh, to the number of workers competing for jobs. It's important to understand that uh, even, in the theory, uh, even in theory, the payment of the worker is not determined by the value of the product. Private capital tends to become concentrated in a few hands, partially because of the competition among the capitalists and partially because technological development and the increasing division of labor encourages the 
formation of larger units of production at the expense of smaller ones. The result in these developments is an oligarchy of private capital, the enormous power of which cannot be effectively checked by even a democratically organized political society. It is true, uh, this is true since the members of the legislative bodies are selected by political parties, largely financed or otherwise influenced by private capitalists, who, for all practical purposes, uh, separate the electorate from the legislature. The consequence is that the representatives of the people do not, in fact, sufficiently protect the interest of the underprivileged sections of the population. Moreover, uh, under existing conditions, private capitalists inevitably control, directly or indirectly, indire the main sources of information, press, radio, education. It is thus extremely difficult, and indeed in most cases quite impossible, for the individual citizen to come to objective conclusions and to make intelligent use of his political rights. The situation prevailing in an economy based on the private ownership of capital is thus characterized by two main principles. First, means of production, capital, are privately owned, and the owners dis uh, dispose of them as they see fit. Second, the labor contract is free. Of course, there is no such thing as a pure uh, capitalist society in this sense. In particular, it should be noted that the workers, uh, through long and bitter political struggles have succeeded in securing a somewhat improved form of the free labor contract. And for certain categories of workers, but taken as a whole, uh, the present day economy does not differ uh, much from pure capitalism. Production is uh, carried on for profit, not for use. There is no provision that all those able and willing to work will always be in a position to find employment. An army of unemployed almost always exists. The worker is, con is in constant fear of losing his job. Since uh, unemployed and poorly paid workers don't provide a profitable market, the production of consumer goods is restricted, and great hardship is the consequence. Technological progress frequently results in more unemployment rather than an easing in the burden of work for all. The profit motive, in conjunction with competition among capitalists, is responsible for an instability in the accumulation and utilization of capital, which leads to increasingly severe depressions. Unlimited competition leads to a huge waste of labor, and that crippling of the social consciousness of individuals which I mentioned before. This crippling of individuals I consider the worst of capitalism. Our whole educational system suffers from this evil. An exaggerated competitive attitude is uh, inculcated into the student who's trained to worship uh, acquisitive success as a preparation for his future career. I'm convinced that there's only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy, accompanied by an educational system which would be oriented towards social goals. In such an economy, the means of production are owned by society itself and are utilized in a planned fashion. A planned economy which adjusts production to the needs of the community would distribute the work to be done uh, among all those able to work and would guarantee a, a livelihood to every man, woman, and child. The education of the individual, in addition to promoting his own innate abilities would attempt to develop in him a sense of responsibility for his fellow men in place of the glorification of power and success in our present society. Nevertheless, it is necessary to remember that a planned economy is not yet socialism. A planned economy as such may be accompanied by the complete enslavement of the individual. The achievement of socialism requires the solution of some extremely difficult socio-political problems. How is this possible? In view of the far-reaching centralization of political and economic power to prevent bureaucracy from becoming all-powerful and overweening, how can the rights of the individual be protected there with a democratic counterweight to the power of bureaucracy be assured?
clarity about aims and problems of socialism is of the greatest significance in our age of transition. Since under present circumstances, free and unhindered discussion of these problems has come under a powerful taboo, I consider the foundation of this magazine to be an important public service. <clears throat> and so that, ladies and gentlemen, was uh, Albert Einstein's article from May 1949 titled, Why Socialism? Thank you for listening.